Computer, initialize Holosuite. Hello everyone, warm welcome back to the Sci-Fi Feminist Podcast. It's already been another week and it's already time for a brand new episode. Today I'm going to be talking about a kung fu movie that I recently saw. Um, it's not only a kung fu movie, it also happens to be a Marvel movie. Maybe you can't classify it as a kung fu movie, but I think it kind of is. It is Shang-Chi. Uh, yeah, Shang-Chi. Uh, yes, today I'm going to talk about the Kung Fu Queens in Shang-Chi. I'm going to talk a bit about four or five prominent female characters that we saw in the movie. I'm going to talk about the movie overall in terms of feminism. And I think, uh, like last week's episode two, this, this week, uh, we can also look a little bit at, at eco-feminist theory as we talk about Shang-Chi. So, Yes, I hope you enjoy today's episode. Before I get into the episode, I would like to thank Ashley Ariel on Patreon for supporting the podcast. Ashley, thank you so much for your generous support. Um, if you would like to receive a shout out on the show, I will even say something personal for you if you like. Uh, you can go to my Patreon page and sign up and uh, you can receive a shout out and some other perks too, if you like. All right, so now let us get into an exciting, fun-filled, kick-ass discussion of the women of Shang-Chi. So before getting into a discussion of the female characters of the movie, I think it would be good to first give my overall impression of the film. So actually, I don't know about everyone else, but I enjoyed it very much. I, um, to the point where I actually saw it twice in the cinema because <laughs> I enjoyed Shang-Chi so much. In general, I really love kung fu movies and I really love movies with fighting and I definitely love movies that feature Michelle Yeoh as a prominent character. So initially, I actually just went to watch it to see Michelle Yeoh, <laughs> but then the movie had all sorts of other nice things too. I, I have to mention it because I found it so funny and, and still when I see that scene, I think it's hilarious. It is the scene where the comedian talks about the first time, or not the comedian, he's kind of an actor, the jester, the comedian, I guess. Um, he talks about what got him into acting. And then he talks about how he saw Planet of the Apes. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm starting to laugh already because it was so funny. And then he says that um, he was so uh, inspired when he saw Planet of the Apes. Because when he asked his mother how the monkeys could learn how to ride horses, his mother explained to him that they were simply acting. Okay, so he, he obviously didn't think that there were people in the, in monkey costumes. He thought they were actually monkeys. So then he said, he, he thinks that, um, the director actually managed to get monkeys to pretend that they were riding horses. And so he thought that, you know, if they could train monkeys to act, then surely he also stands a chance as an actor. Um, I thought that was absolutely lovely. And, um, yeah, uh, there's another scene where he's lying, uh, in the battlefield and presumably dead and that little weird creature friend that he made uh, from Tao Lo comes to him and is kind of worried like oh shame Trevor died and then he's like <laughs> wakes up he's like it's only a performance I'm not I'm not dead I'm only acting <laughs> so uh, some really nice comic relief so anyway I just wanted to share that I thought it was quite funny um Yes, and another important thing that I think this movie did really well was the fact that the characters actually speak Chinese. Um, I think it's Chinese or Mandarin. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm speaking out of ignorance here. But they don't only speak English. And, um, you know, this is something that uh, we've seen in so many films. You know, the kind of westernization of... Movies that are 
Asian, um, any type of Asian movie, uh, I don't know, Japanese, um, how many animes are dubbed over into English to suit a Western audience? Um, also, uh, Korean, although many Korean, um, films and series I've seen are actually in Korean, which I really love. And then many of these Hong Kong films, um, and even more popular ones. For example, uh, Memoirs of a Geisha, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, um, even the, the second Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny, it all plays off in, in China <laughs> or somewhere in Asia, yet the characters are speaking English. And, um, you know, there, there aren't any, um, I don't know, American or British or English people there, but these characters speak English. And the first time I saw Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny, I was a little bit taken aback by that because um, I'm like, you know, this is in China. Why are they speaking English? So I think this is kind of a thing that American cinema does. Um, it draws on that, ex that, and I, this is in quotation marks, the exoticism, you know, the exotic nature of these foreign countries, um, foreign, again, uh, in quotation marks, you know, it's all constructed what we perceive as foreign or not. Um, and then it reinforces, first of all, um, Hollywood or traditional or westernized notions of cinema upon them. So we see, um, you know, China from the, from the cinema, cinematic conventions of America and also in terms of language. Um, and I feel that is just kind of another form of colonizing <laughs> the East, <laughs> colonizing, uh, Africa, colonizing, um, yeah, South America, um, all of these types of films. And of course, you know, it makes sense. Not everyone wants to watch a film in, um, you know, if, if you don't like reading subtitles, then of course, then you don't, you don't want to, you want to watch a film in English. After all, it was made in Hollywood. Um, but I think what this did is it added a layer of complexity to the film. And it also adds a sort of acknowledgement that, um, you know, these are, um, we're, we're looking at Asian heroes. We're not looking at, um, American superheroes, although some of, you know, at some point they are in America and Shang-Chi is technically also American. Um, it pays homage to that, uh, his, his Asian, um, descent and his Asian heritage. And we see that especially in the scene where, um, the guy with the 10 rings, a very, very old guy, <laughs> uh, that looks very handsome and young. Yeah. What a handsome actor. Um, when he asks Katie, what's your Chinese name? And then she gives her Chinese name. And then he goes on about how important names are and what people are called, how it changes their destiny or determines their destiny. So um, I really think there is an acknowledgement of that, which I think is very good. Um, yeah, I think it's a kind of a move in cinema towards uh, you know, acknowledging other cultures and not just placing, placing our Western view on all of them. I think that's why I really love the Hong Kong movies because they're made in Hong Kong. Um, and although they're certainly influenced by, uh, Western notions of cinema, um, we don't see too much of that. And of course, it's all in, um, in Chinese or in Mandarin and, or in, um, Cantonese, I think is the other language. Um, that Michelle Yeoh often speaks to. Um, yeah, so, so it's a bit more uh, realistic, I feel, <laughs> at least in terms of cinema. Okay, but now moving beyond the conventions of cinema, let's look at some of the female characters. So the prominent female characters in Shang-Chi, I would say definitely there is Katie. Now, Katie is, as you know, she is American. She's Shang-Chi's uh, closest friend. And yeah, in the beginning, she starts off as sort of a, um, not a weak character, but as someone who, she's kind of tomboyish. And um, yeah, she doesn't really, um, yeah, obviously she doesn't do any fighting or anything like that in the beginning. But then later when she learns, she actually becomes 
quite a significant warrior in terms of the final battle, um, shooting that ugly demon thing that tries to suck the dragon's soul, uh, shooting it in the throat and actually saving the dragon and saving, saving everything. Um, we see that actually the real hero in this movie might not be Shang-Chi, but it might actually be the woman around Shang-Chi. So yes, that's Katie. And um, I'll get back to her and driving a little bit later. Um, first, let me just list the characters. Then there's Jia Ling. I'm hoping I'm saying her um, her name correctly. It's Shang-Chi's sister. Um, what a badass character. The first time she was introduced, I was like, whoa, <laughs> very cool. Um, the first time we actually meet her is in that fighting ring. And then she actually built that place from the ground. She built like her whole own underground fighting rink that gets, uh, that gets streamed on the dark web, like by herself when she was 16 years old. And then she's like the top fighter there, which is very awesome. Um, yes, again, a, a powerful female character and I'll talk about her a bit more. And then, of course, Leiko Wu, who is um, the guy with the seven rings, uh, not the seven rings, the ten rings. He has ten rings, sorry. It's his uh, wife. Um, obviously, we, she's not introduced to us as his wife in the beginning, but uh, she becomes his wife. And quite an interesting character arc that happens to her in terms of losing her powers after getting married and then not being able to defend herself after getting married. Um, I think it says something maybe quite interesting about marriage <laughs> and motherhood, but then I'll get more into that. And then, of course, Jiang Nan. Um, she is uh, Shang-Chi's aunt and she's played by Michelle Yeoh. I love to see Michelle Yeoh fighting in movies and um, there's this beautiful, beautiful scene where um, Shang-Chi and Michelle Yeoh, she kind of trains him and um, she does this thing like the circular motion with her arms and then she actually, um, the leaves start moving and she wears this yellow, uh, yellow, kimono dress type of thing um that's really just a beautiful scene i was crying twice when i saw that <laughs> um i i'm quite interested to to find out what fighting style they're actually doing in in the film um because the fighting style that the guy from the that has the 10 rings maybe i should just get his name and stop referring to him as the guy with the 10 rings but um his fighting style and the fighting style of the people in Tao Lo is quite different. And uh, we see his fighting style is much more masculine, um, much more forceful. And theirs is much more, um, and I put this in quotation marks too, feminine. Um, and very interestingly, with this more feminine fighting style, they are actually using nature and um, they are in, in harmony with nature with this fighting style. I don't know if it's Tai Chi. I need to ask my sensei at the karate um, <laughs> what what she thinks is the, the fighting style. Um, if I get an answer from her, then um, I will I will let everyone know on my next week's podcast uh, what fighting style it is because it is a very beautiful style fighting style I felt and um, we see how they are much more in harmony with nature than the guy with 10 rings and then at the end of the day it is this fighting style that actually wins the more feminine fighting style that um, that's in harmony with nature and everything else that actually uh, beats the guy with the 10 rings so very interesting there all right, so then let's talk about each character briefly. And first up, we have Katie. Um, yes, Katie. So Katie is Shang-Chi's friend. Uh, she is uh, American. She stays in America, um, but obviously she has Chinese heritage. Um, and what I found quite interesting about her character is that she's kind of a tomboy. Um, and I think even 
what well what's also significant is the fact that she and shang chi don't have a romantic relationship uh, maybe later towards the end of the film, you see something starting to happen, but they are really just friends and they just like to do really naughty things together, like go um, <laughs> taking the cars of the people at the valet and um, <laughs> driving around with the fast cars. So what's interesting about her is that, yeah, like I said, she's a bit of a tomboy and very interestingly, she drives really well. And her parents always complaining that she doesn't have a proper job, you know, <laughs> the only job she does is parking people's cars. But actually, um, the fact that she can drive so well is kind of what saves them in the first real incident or the first real action or fight scene um, on the bus. So what happens is uh, she and Chang Sang Chi kind of work together. He does all the fighting he fights off the bad guys and then um, she drives the bus that loses its brakes and that um, goes downhill. And um, yeah, because of her driving, she actually um, saves everyone on the bus. So, of course, you know, there is that stereotype that women are bad drivers, which is absolutely not true. Um, so I think, I don't know if it's, you know, intentional, but, um, definitely one thing that this movie does is it subverts the stereotype that women are bad drivers, or maybe she is a terrible driver because she really wrecks the bus and lots of other things, but, uh, I don't think so. Um, yeah, Katie is, is, I think a positive representation for women in that sense, also in the sense that she's more normal looking. Um, she's not super skinny, super tall, um, you know, this perfect ideal of beauty. But when I look at her, I kind of feel like, oh, it's just kind of like me, <laughs> a little bit short, uh, a little bit tomboyish, a little bit clumsy. Um, she, she presents us an ideal of femininity that is not so exclusionary. And of course, she's uh, really funny too. She provides some comic relief and, um, yeah, like I mentioned, very significant scene at the end. Once she actually trains and once she learns to be able to shoot the bow, especially, um, she becomes one of the biggest impacts on the final scene, the final fight scene, which kind of determines the fate of the world. Um, she sort of, well, not single-handedly, but she plays a very big role in the outcome of that final battle. So towards the end of the film, um, the, the big, is it called a soul eater comes out and it's trying to, yeah, you know, sucking everyone's souls as soul eaters do. And, um, yeah, at some point the soul eater grabs the dragon. And then if the dragon's soul gets sucked out, then all hope is lost because then the soul eater will be super powerful. And Shang-Chi and his sister are on the dragon and, um, they can't really do anything about the soul sucking of the dragon. But Katie is there with her bow and her arrow and, uh, she actually just learned how to shoot the bow. But she takes the shot and, um, she actually shoots the, the demons or the soul eater's throat. And because of that one shot, actually the dragon soul returns to it and it, uh, it can go on and it can live on. So, um, and then they can win the battle after, after that. So, um, yeah, she, she becomes quite a significant female character. Maybe not a, a kung fu queen in the traditional sense. Um, but she learns to shoot the bow and her actions have a big impact on the outcome of the film. So yes, that is Katie, a very, um, enjoyable female character. Next, uh, Shang-Chi's sister. Um, let me just get her name again. Oh, I closed the tab with their names. I think it's Xia Ling. Yeah. That is her name. She, uh, yeah, okay. Much more to talk about here <laughs> with her. Um, we see some very subtle feminist commentary in some of the conversations that she has with Katie and also in, uh, how we see 
um, how she was raised and also in who she becomes. So I think very significantly, we can see that their father, after their mother died, raised them, um, yeah, well, it's the patriarchy that kind of ruled after that. Um, he makes this army of killers and um, only men are allowed to be part of that army. And he especially trains Shang-Chi to go and find his mother's killers. And then she, as a child, she's just kind of forced to watch. She's not allowed to take part in the action. She's not allowed to take part in the fighting or even to learn any of the fighting but she just has to sit on the sides and watch them fight and watch them train so she's kind of excluded from this very patriarchal um, mini society that her father created and um, i think significantly towards the end once they enter tao lo which is represented as a much more of a feminine type of um land or mythical place you know where everything is harmonious especially in harmony with nature and the earth so as i keep mentioning in episodes the idea that um the earth is a woman mother nature um the idea that the earth is feminine and the idea that women are closer to nature and closer to the earth and somehow more in tune with nature and um we see that michelle yo's character actually tells her here um because she sits on the side and watches the other people train even as an adult and um michelle yo's character sees this and she says here we train as equals so that's the point where she actually gets up and she starts training and then um <laughs> anyway she's quite proficient at uh the rope with the spear Yo, that thing. I think if I ever had to try that weapon, I would like slap myself in the face with a spear so many times. <laughs> I don't know how you control that. Um, I think another thing I need to ask my sensei about because, um, yeah, I don't know. Very cool weapon, but it looks like, you know, if you don't know how to do that properly, you could really get slapped in the face by a spear. <laughs> um, anyway, and then she trains and then, um, she also has a very big impact on the outcome of the final battle. Um, so yes, then at some point she and Katie meet each other and she tells, uh, when, when they go to the father's uh, house, <laughs> his little empire place, um, you know, Katie is kind of like freaking out or kind of scared because, you know, the dad is scary. <laughs> And then the sister tells her, just um, don't say anything and just sit, you know, don't say anything, don't talk first, um, just sit. And that's how I survived all these years after my mother died. So we see that, um, you know, in that patriarchal space, uh, women are really supposed to be submissive, um, cannot say anything, cannot do anything, cannot train together, um, not even allowed to speak. And... Um, I think it's very nice to see a character that comes from that type of place, but still had the determination and the self-sufficiency to actually teach herself all of the fighting and to actually run away at the age of 16 and to go out into America and to create, or is she in America? No, she's not. Um, I forgot where she is. Um... Uh, yeah, the place is mentioned. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, anyway, she goes and she she makes this uh, underground fighting ring. <laughs> and she is the ruler of this uh, underground fighting ring that gets streamed on the dark web. So she becomes a very powerful um, female character, a very powerful woman in that sense. Um so I think, yeah, I really love that character because we really see a progression from very submissive female character that comes from a very patriarchal um, society that goes out, makes a name for herself, and then finally at the end, um, you know, meets the the woman in Tao Lo and actually really displays all her strength as a female fighter. So yes, that is it relating to Shang-Chi's sister. 
Next character is the mother. Um, yes, what a beautiful actress. Uh, I, I don't think I've come across her in the Hong Kong movies. Maybe I have. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I was really, she's quite beautiful. And, um, yeah, like I say, the, the fighting style that the people in Taolo use is a very beautiful style. So, again, the first time, uh, we meet her, um, she is seen in nature, really in harmony with her surroundings. I think she's collecting water or something. Um, yeah, at the end of the maze, um, kind of the, yeah, the entrance to Taolo. And basically what happens is she meets the guy with the ten rings and they have a sort of a, a fight and then they fall in love. Um, yeah, quite an interesting way to fall in love. Just get beaten up and then <laughs> thrown into the river and then like, oh, she's so beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never fallen in love like that, but I kind of get it. Um, maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, so then what happens is she gets married and interestingly, then both of them give up their powers and, um, of obviously she has the power from the spirit of the dragon so her fighting is not just pure you know kung fu or tai chi or whatever she's doing um it is actually infused by some spiritual power from the dragon that's why like the moves and the thing the the trees and things also move when when she does her moves <laughs> and um the the man gives up the 10 rings and then they make this uh, really beautiful nuclear family and um they kind of live happily ever after until they don't um one day she's outside with her kids and then some gangsters come from yeah, who's upset with the guy with the ten rings from the past because he used to be a very violent person and they actually kill her. Um, and I don't know if I'm reading too much into this because actually the man also gives up his power during when they get married, but it's kind of because she gave up her powers that she got murdered. If she didn't, then she would have been fine. But I don't know if this is maybe suggesting that, you know, once once a woman gets married and has children, she gives up some sense of her power, um, some sense of independence, some sense of power. Um, like I say, I might be reading too much into this. And of course, it's not like that in all cases. But this is certainly something that the movie suggests and something that we might wonder about. Um, it's like if you go back to feminist theory, I think that's why I'm on this line of argument. Um, this has been argued by many second wave feminists, especially if you remember the discussion of Monique Wittig um, and also some other gender theorists like Judith Butler, um, Adrian Rich, there's quite a few um, that kind of suggests that you know, women are independent and strong and women are doing good up to the point where they get married. And especially as the second way feminists argued, um, get married to a man. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just throwing it out there. Um, like I say, I don't agree with all of these arguments that the second way feminists made. Um, I also don't necessarily agree, um, you know, if the movie suggests that that is the case, then I don't necessarily agree with that either. But yeah, that is just um, an interesting thing to point out. Um, the fact that she loses that power as soon as um, she has kids and she gets married and um, yeah, gets kicked out by the people of Taolo and um, yeah, to pursue her family. And in the end of the day, that is kind of the reason why she gets killed. And even more than that, she gets killed because of her husband's past indiscretions, because of the violence that he committed in the past, not the violence that she committed in the past. Yes. All right. So then let's move on to the final character, Michelle Yeoh's character, the aunt. Um, 
I guess there's not too much to say about her except for the fact that, you know, she stays in Taolo. And like I mentioned, we continually see this dichotomy between uh, the feminine Taolo and the masculine Ten Rings. Um, there is the scene where the the man with the Ten Rings finally... Should I just call him the Emperor? I'm just going to call him the Emperor. I know he's not an Emperor, but when he finds Taolo, and they come there with all their, like, cars and, like, all this really macho stuff, and they're, like, black armor and clothing and the huge bodyguard and, um, you know, all this, like, really macho stuff... And you have the people of Tao Lo who are so peaceful, harmonious. They are in, they're not dressed in armor, um, or even if they are dressed in armor, even their armor is made from nature. It is made of dragon scales. Um, and interestingly then, when those soul, soul eaters or soul suckers come out, actually all of that masculine power, all the, the, the like, swords and hectic weapons and things have no effect against um against these creatures they need to use and i'm also you know putting this in quotation marks the more feminine <laughs> the more natural um dragon scale armor and weapons from tao lo to actually defeat the demons so patriarchy you know it could suggest that actually patriarchy has no place there there is no place for patriarchy there. It has no effect there. Um, and it's interesting, of course, too, that the dragon is uh, referred to as she. The dragon is referred to as a woman. So even the the dragon um, is this feminine force that protects the people. And it's this feminine force that helped them to overcome the evil in the past in the first place. And it is... Um, their duty to kind of protect it so um yeah a lot of how can i say um i really really think that um taolo is represented more as this feminine this feminine place and then interestingly at the end of the day which is the one that wins it is taolo it is actually um shang chi that learns the feminine more feminine martial art from his aunt with that feminine martial art, he actually beats his father, the one with the Ten Rings, and then he gains the Ten Rings. And then um, it is with the dragon scales that they actually are able to destroy those creatures. So at the end of the day, what we also see quite significant is the impact of the mother's lineage on the children. Something that we see quite often in um, especially superhero movies is... Well, not only superhero movies, but most action movies is this um, patriarchal lineage that we see continued. Um, it's always the father uh, giving his power to the son. And that's how they continue the patriarchal lineage. But um, in Shang-Chi, it's a little bit different. Um, although both parents die and although he does receive the Ten Rings from his father... Only once the Ten Rings are imbued with the power from Tao Lo and used, um, used in the, in the feminine martial arts style, the more feminine martial arts style used in combination with that, that he actually beats his father and that he, um, gains the power from the Ten Rings. So we really see the mother's huge impact on the children. Um, of course, we also see many flashbacks of where the mother taught them her martial arts style. And then once he fights with his aunt, Michelle Yeoh, I wish she was my aunt. <laughs> um, in real life, I mean. <laughs> um, once he, he learns the fighting style with her, he's also reminded of the flashbacks of everything that his mother taught him. And it is with this that at the end of the day, they actually win. So, yes, I think in terms of representing women and um, in terms of the overall narrative arc, um, Shang-Chi is actually more a movie about women than it is about Shang-Chi himself. And I think maybe that's why I really enjoyed it so much and why I ended up watching it twice. Also, because I have no life, I ended up watching it twice. Um, yeah, in the cinema. But um, 
is a good movie in terms of women's representation. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's um, got some very nice comic moments, very beautiful, very nice fight scenes. I always love to see these. And I think definitely maybe next week or in the near future, I might do an episode on Hong Kong movies. Um, you will find some very interesting female characters in the Hong Kong movies too. Um, this week's movie recommendation, um, since we talked about Planet of the Apes, I recommend watching Planet of the Apes um, and see how how did they teach the monkeys to ride horses. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, very classic, brilliant sci-fi, the original Planet of the Apes. So yeah, just as a side note. All right, that is the episode for today. I hope everyone enjoyed the episode. Um, as always, go follow the Sci-Fi Fem Feminist on Instagram, uh, the YouTube page, uh, on Patreon if you want extra perks. Um, yes, thank you everyone for listening and see everyone again next week for another exciting episode. I, um, I'm going to watch No Time to Die this week, so I'm quite excited to see James Bond. Uh, what's going on there. I saw Eva Green is in it, so I can't wait to see that. Um, yes, anyway, another irrelevant side note. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you for listening. This is the Sci-Fi Feminist signing off. Live long and prosper. Bye-bye. This show is brought to you by Sweet Media. Computer, list other available Sweet Media programs. Loading Sweet Preview Program 4, The Fluffernutter, an Expeditionary Force podcast. One of the best parts of the book is when Joe introduces Skippy once they hit orbit. <laughs> <laughs> he changes his skin to, was it, Bud Light, and <laughs> says absolutely nothing. <laughs> that, that, was, that was hysterical. That was absolutely hysterical. And why, and why did he choose Bud Light? Oh. Joe asks this question, it's just like, how does he know so much about Earth culture? Loading Holosuite Preview Program 4, Blast Shield, a Star Trek Lower Decks podcast. I think we all thought Ransom was going to go into that fight scene, thinking that it was game over before it even started and he was going to lose. But I think the moment he rips his uniform off, <laughs> yeah. which is hard anyway to rip a shirt, but to rip an actual like jacket like that, mm. pretty impressive. And then he had like about, I don't know, I think it was like 62 abs. He just looked ripped and then he was just like you know a little bit of this yeah a little bit of that i was just gonna say it was the way that he also narrated it it was just perfect it was great ransom definitely went to the school of kirk foo ransom foo maybe we should be calling it computer deactivate hollow suite